Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jesse Plants. We need you to subscribe to YouTube by clicking and hitting the bell. If you click and hit the bell, you'll know when we're there. That's YouTube. Click and hit the bell. So Micah, chapter 7, I want to read something, he's, he's, and he's just frustrated, but he sees something in God that very few people can see, and that is Micah chapter 7, verse 18. He says this, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now, I really believe when he was writing that, I think Michael was thinking about when Pharaoh and his armies were drowned in the depths of the sea. I know of a person had a, just a true story, had a very, very expensive watch. And he went fishing with it. Let me show you the depth of the sea. See, there's places, even now, we may have been to the moon. We're trying to get to Mars. But we can't get to some of the deepest parts of the ocean because of the pressurization that's there. We might send, we did get down to one of the lowest places, but then the windows started cracking on this piece of machinery because of the amount of pressure that is. Well, he was out fishing. He went out there and he slapped his hand and the watch went in the ocean. Never to be remembered again. <laughs> Can't go that far. That's how your sin is. Man can't get to it. This is what God, this unique person called God in the form of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This superstructure of salvation, which he calls the doctrine of forgiveness. And I want to deal with that this morning. So write this down if you're taking notes. God is incomparable. For none can do as he does. Let me say that again. God is incomparable. Who could you compare him with? God is incomparable. For none can do as he does. Why? Because he is absolute uniqueness. He's not just unique. He is absolute uniqueness. You cannot compare him with anything, anywhere, anyhow, at any time. He's so far above it. And when he created you, he knew you'd mess up, but he knew he would take your sin, wash it away, bear it in the sea, pardon your iniquity in every area of your life if you just repent, if you just asked him. Now that's unique. This, I mean, he's so unique in all of Think about what he does and how he does it, and what he wants to do for you. My theme this year was, what can I do for thee? What shall I do for thee? He's just wanting to do something for you, spiritually, physically, and financially. Watch this, the church world can't handle it. They fight prosperity, and you need it. They fight healing, and you sick. But this God, this unique, absolute person called God said, I'll heal you. I'll save you. I'll forgive you. I'll love you. I delight in mercy. I will forget my anger. I will do everything to get you to me. The Philistine God, Dagon, didn't do that. He killed you. No one could compare to the God we serve. And I personally, no one can compare to the Christianity Jesus taught. Think about what he did. So let me say it again. The God is incomparable for none can do as he does. And why? Because he is absolute uniqueness. Write this down. The fact of his ability to forgive. Let me say it again. The fact of his ability to forgive removes the Lord far beyond the sphere of comparison. He will forgive. 
I mean, it's amazing to me what he does. The worst sinner, the worst killer, a serial killer, he will forgive if they ask for forgiveness. Let me say it again. The fact of his ability to forgive removes the Lord far beyond the sphere of comparison. Why would God save Jesse Duplantis, a heathen of heathens, a chief of sinners who enjoyed sin greatly, who didn't care about anyone but himself, who would do anything to get to the top before he was born again? Even the removal of his wife on the day of your marriage. If I am going to do this, and if you can't do it, you can leave today. That's sad, isn't it? It's not that I didn't love her. It had nothing to do with that. I was completely saturated with ambition. To do, and I didn't care what I needed to do to get that done. Nothing. I was willing to do it. That's why the La Cosa Nostra, the mafia said, he could be one of us because you got in my way. That man you're talking about, God buried that sucker to never rise again. Me. I would do whatever it took. What a smile on my face. He said, well, I can't be. Well, you never met that man. And you never will. You see what I'm saying? See, this comparable God. And when I said, Lord, Forgive me. Whatever Billy says, Billy Grant, boom, took my sin and put it behind it, put it in the seat, pardoned all my iniquities, made me the righteousness of God, all happening in an instant. This unique God. That's what Michael was seeing in the midst of all his sin. That's what I see today with everything going wrong. With everybody going, everybody crazy. I just look at this unique God said, they have no idea what he will do if they let him. Yes. Let me get these two points to you again. God is incomparable for none can do as he does. Why? Because he is absolute uniqueness. You ought to underline that in your notes. Absolute. And then the second point, the fact of his ability to forgive removes the Lord far beyond the sphere of comparison. Let me tell you why. Because see, forgiveness is contrary. And let me just say it perfectly. Forgiveness is contrary to the nature of all things. It's contrary. The nature of all things is payback time. That's why you had to put in the Bible, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I mean, I even tried to twist that. I tried to spin it. I said, I ain't looking for vengeance. I just want a little justice. Yeah, but I wanted to do the justice. You see what I'm saying? No, I had an agenda. Forgiveness is really, it's contrary to the nature of all things. It's very hard to forgive. Jesus said, what is easy to say that, that, uh, that, that I forgive your sins, I'll take them in your bed and walk. It was hard for Jesus, but that you may know that the Son of Man had power upon the earth to forgive sins. Get up and get out of here. And he healed him and forgave him of his sins. Then he gave something to the apostles and to you under the certain, at certain times and anointings that what sins you remit would be remitted and what sins you retain would be retained. Trust you enough to speak like he speaks, talk like he talks, act like he acts because you're made in his image and in his likeness. This superstructure of salvation called the doctrine of forgiveness. You see that? Am, am I, this is a prelude to what I'm trying to get to here. Just now I'm going to get heavy into this, but I want you to understand that. See, if a person breaks the law, write that down. If a person breaks the law, the world never quite forgive that person. Why? They have a record. You can see it. He saved, but he went to prison. You can see with the flip of the hand. He went to prison. A smirk on his face. Now, I know he's saved, but we've got to watch him. And that's true in one sense. But you see, forgiveness has to produce forgetfulness. That's what God did. Suck it. Let me say it again. If a person breaks the law, the world never quite forgives him. He got a record. 
And he, I don't care what you've done. They'll say, well, you know, he's back with the Lord, but you know what he did? Do you know what happened in 1933? No, I wasn't born. My daddy was barely a little baby. No. See, that's what the world, that's what the world says. Uh, even though you have paid for your transgression, you may have went to prison, you may have went to, you paid for it. But the world doesn't just quite forgive you. Because you go to get a job, they want to know where you, what you've done in your past. You see, that's the man's way of doing things. But God, this God, this unique God, and he did it all to the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. He did it through the weakness of a person, which Satan could not understand. He said, if we would have known, we'd have never crucified him. He didn't know. Why? Because he has never forgotten either. He doesn't know what forgiveness is. He doesn't understand salvation. See what I'm saying? Which means soundness. So if a person breaks the law, the world will never quite forgive him. You see, people get mad at me because I like Ephesians 5, 1 working in my life. Be you therefore imitators of God as dear children. So I like to delight in mercy. I've had many opportunities to get back at people because of a position I, I, I attained in my ministry, people that hurt me, and I could have nailed them to the wall because without sounding properly arrogant, I have a voice. You see what I'm saying? And I've had people ask me to use it against me, and I've refused to do that. Why? Because... I would become like the world. The reason why I don't want to do those things, I don't want to become you. I don't want to become what I hate. You see what I'm saying? You see, so what I do is I, I look like Micah. I will look to this unique, absolute unique God, and if he delighteth in mercy, and if he pardoneth iniquity, if he throws sin behind him, and he throws in the depths of the sea never to be remembered, and so will Jesse, because I'm made in his image and I'm made in his likeness. Are you understanding that? Even though in the natural, I have a right to do some things I could do, but I'm not natural. I lost that part too, because God put his super on my natural. That superstructure of salvation, the doctrine of forgiveness, Write this down. The gospel is not a system of do's and don'ts. The gospel is not a system of do's and don'ts or sanction and prohibition. Or sanction and prohibition. But what is it? But a charter of freedom whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Do you know I can remember my sin and God can't? Isn't that amazing? Let me say it again. The gospel is not a system of do's and don'ts or sanction and prohibition, but a charter of freedom. People get mad at me because I'm a free man, but whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I like being free. I enjoy being free. It is actually a good representation of being a Christian. Why are you so free? Well, he made me free. Yeah, but you ought to be suffering. You ought to be mad at somebody. Let's go split a church somewhere. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Why? I'm free. Yeah. Free. Free at last. Yeah. Can you hear it? Yeah. Free at last. Yeah. Thank God. Oh, thank who? Yeah. The movement? No. Come on, listen. That's what he was saying. Thank God Almighty, because only Almighty can do this. Yeah. Free at last. That's a charter there. Something happened. Yeah. See, so the gospel is not a system of do's and don'ts. If you do this or you don't do that, you're going to be with us. Or sanction and prohibition. We're going to sanction that person. We're going to put prohibition on them. No, it's a charter of freedom. Love your enemies. Oh, how can you do that? By the superstructure of salvation and the doctrine of forgiveness. That's how you do that. Bless those that curse you. Whoo, how can you do that? Delight in mercy. 
I've had people just curse me. I said, you can't hate me as much as I love you. Ooh, that doesn't make them matter. But it's the truth. You see, so I refuse to preach you do's and don'ts. I just tell you what the truth says. What is the truth? Sin will destroy you. The old cliche, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, charge you more than you want to pay. I think somebody said that many, many, many years ago. And that's so true. Sin is very expensive. Yeah. See, and you have to understand that a lot of things you tell God that you did in the past, he don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Not only has he forgot it, it has become non-existent. See that? This God of absolute uniqueness. So let me say it again. The gospel is not in a system of do's and don'ts. Some of you out there watching in different countries, you get this. Or sanction and prohibition, but a charter of freedom. See, that's how apartheid started in South Africa. The, watch this. It came from the Dutch Reformed Church. You wouldn't think that come from the church. And those Dutch people wanted Africa so bad that they even formed their own language called Afrikaans to suppress and subdue and put down the black man of that nation. But some man stood up, Nelson Mandela. Went to jail for 30 years, but he didn't change him. Why? What, what was in him? This unique ability to forgive. And when he got in power, boy, a lot of people got, they said, boy, you're going to get back. No, no. I'm not going to do what they did to us. You see him going to the big stadium. And that, that was nothing but a white group of athletes. And they said they wanted to shut it down. He wouldn't. He backed it. Why? Because he was looking through the eyes of God Almighty. And that's what made him a great man. You see what I'm saying? Was he perfect? No. Are you? It has nothing to do with perfection. It has to do with what God's already done. Are y'all getting this? I, I, I want to slow down enough for you to understand it because you may have some old skeletons that it's time for house cleaning. Mm. How do you know when it happens? It's what's happening in the world today. Moral deterioration. Write this down. Moral deterioration is always a record of heart alienation from God. Moral deterioration is always a record of heart alienation from God. You can take, you can see that, well, you can see when people start getting away from God, sin becomes rampant, murder. We don't care because there's not standard. Ladies and gentlemen, sin will send you to hell. God don't want you to go to hell. Or well, you know, a loving God would not send a person to hell. He didn't. They did. Why does God forgive and forget? Write this down. God's forgiveness and forgetfulness stops the wreckage of people's lives to be washed up on the beach of life. Let me say it again. God's forgiveness and forgetfulness stops the wreckage of people's lives to be washed up on the beach of life. He puts it so deep it can't be washed up. The wreckage of your past deeds. Now, what the church does sometimes, they'll get around the sea of forgetfulness and they'll, they'll get some, goop, some scuba gear and, and they try to get down to the bottom to find out who you are. But they're going to die trying because the pressure of forgiveness will destroy them. Amen. Just like the pressure in that deep will destroy you. Let me say it again. God's forgiveness and forgetfulness stops the wreckage of people's lives to be washed up on the beach of life. How does he do that? He delights in mercy. Have you noticed my son, Jesse? God brags on me all the time. Did I shock you with that? He does. I brag on him all the time. Yeah. We 
like each other. You see what I'm saying? He does my work. I do his work. Some of y'all missed that right there. Lord Jesus, listen to what I'm saying. He gets involved in my work. I get involved in his work. Isn't that a blessing? He delights in it. And the Bible said, delight yourself therefore in the Lord. Watch this. He'll give you the what? The what? A little louder. The what? Of whose heart? Whose heart? Whose heart, Lord? Why do you have a problem receiving that? Because you're looking at the wreckage of the past. Hmm. So God's forgiveness and forgetfulness stops the wreckage of people's lives to be washed up on the beach of life. I got up this morning, I said, hello, Jesus. He said, hi, Jesse. We had a good time. <laughs> last night, boy, when I went to bed, I said, oh, Lord, what a good day. But when I eat dinner last night with some, good, some, some friends, I, I enjoyed myself. I got back into bed. I said, man, I said, I had a good day. He said, I know she was enjoying yourself. I said, yeah. He said, I was enjoying watching you. And we said something, and we laughed, and we thought we had a good, nice time. It was a blessing. Hallelujah. I ordered some ice cream, and Kathy went, no, no, and ate it all. <laughs> everybody, well, not everybody, uh, <laughs> almost all of it, you know. <laughs> it's a temptation. She has a hard time stopping. And I said, just enjoy yourself. We're having a good day today. Yeah. Satan tried to hurt someone. And my God, they were there just smiling. I said, oh, devil, you can give it your best shot, but you can't win, baby. You're not going to, you're already lost. You're a loser going away to lose. On the limits of retardation, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You see, had a nice time. Then we drove home. And my God, man, it was just such a blast. Kathy said, I'm going in my massage chair. She likes that crazy chair. I call it a torture chamber. I don't go in that thing. I'm telling you, if you got one in there, it hurts you. I told Leroy all the time, he said, I'm going to try. I said, don't get in there, Leroy. Oh, no, no. I believe it's okay. I said, Leroy, I'm your friend. I'm trying to help you. Stay out of there. He got in that thing and he was sore for three days. He said, oh, I hurt. And I said, mm -mm. <laughs> Pulls you, squeeze your legs, jerk you. Make you do this. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Not me. I went to bed feeling good. Got up feeling good. It was a blessing. Write this down. Forgiveness deals only with the past. Let me say it again. Forgiveness deals only with the past. The forgiven soul needs power for the present and the future. See, forgiveness deals only with the past because the past never sees the future. The forgiven soul needs power for the present and future. When God forgave me, I needed power for my present and my future. How do you stop drinking a fifth of whiskey a day? That's just during the day. You finish that about 4.30 in the afternoon. Then you're going to the club and now you start drinking and you drink four of those stainless steel malt cups they used to make milkshakes out of from 9 to about 2 o'clock. You are so pickled. How do you stop that? I needed power for the present and the future. I got born again in a bathroom in Boston, Massachusetts. Didn't even know how to pray the prayer of, <laughs> of salvation. I said, whatever Billy says. Well, evidently the Lord heard Billy and accepted my prayer, Billy Graham. I drank enough scotch, tequila, bourbon, vodka, 151 Puerto Rican rum. <clears throat> Moonshine. This stuff would start your car. 
It would start your, you could run your car on moonshine. 200 proof. Look at Glenn, he's probably tasted that himself. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, put that in your body to kill you. God's mercy said, we're going we gonna, to we gonna, we gonna save this fool. Stop it. Boom. Cussing, cussing, cussing. Every other word, cuss, cuss. God. Kathy said, I notice you have a new language. <laughs> Remember that you said that to me? Went into that club, not playing that thing, and that girl started putting that Chevy's Regal scotch and water, and I, and I said, I don't want any, and I heard myself say, I can't believe I said that, I don't want any. <laughs> Body change, this unique, phenomenal God. Forgave me. See, forgiveness only deals with the past. Now, I had to have something to walk in the present and the future. And what I did, I found me a Gideon Bible in a hotel. I don't know if they're still there. I don't know. If it was a blessing. I didn't start with the book of John. That's what everybody started. I started with page one. That's how you read a book. <laughs> it's true. I started with page one. It says, in the beginning. I said, I'm at the beginning. <laughs> this is me. God created the heaven and earth. Wow, man, I've never seen that before. Whoa, he did. I started with the word, and I've kept it ever since. And as I read more and read more, I developed more and developed more to the point that I've actually forgot some of my worst sins. And so when people say, you know what you did? No, I didn't do that. Yes, you did. No, I did not. What? That man died. He doesn't exist. I'm a new creature with a new feature in Christ. Forgiveness deals only with the past. The forgiven soul needs power for the present and the future. I want, this is very important what I'm about ready to say, and I want you to write it down. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily change a person's character or nature. Mm -mm. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily change a person's character or nature. See, what got born again is your spirit man. Now, you have to develop your character and your nature to listen to that spirit man through a renewed soul and a crucified body. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily change a person's character or nature. See, that's what confuses people. Okay, let's say they're drinking a lot. And they got saved. Or they're doing drugs. And they got saved. They're so excited. They came to the altar. They cried. Shouted, praise God. Hallelujah. They got saved. They can't understand when they walked out the church, why they have the temptation of wanting to drink again. Or they want to do the drugs again. What happened? It didn't change your nature or your character. It changed your spirit. Now, your spirit, through a renewed soul, mind, will, and most be not conformed, this will be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may know that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, huh? So that when these things come at you, you go, oh no, that man died. I have power now to say no to all those things. See, and that's confusing to people. So they try to spin it. Well, you know, the Lord put the marijuana, you know, the herb, the herb in the ground for us to enjoy the herb. See, that's an unrenewed mind. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily change a person's character or nature. See, that's why preachers mess up. Because their character is not equal to their gift. They have the gifting of God. They've been called to preach. They can lay hands on the sick and they recover. But they can't control themselves. Or right, let's put it in the secular world. You can make the whole world laugh. Robin Williams, just fall out. But he goes home depressed and kills himself. See, now you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that doesn't mean because you're born again that your character and nature has been changed. You have been changed, your spirit. Now it's for you to change your character. I will not do that and change your nature. I will not look upon that. My God. Now Joseph had, he had power even though the spirit of God wasn't like it is today 
but he had such a unique love of God. And this woman puts the hit on him. He says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? See, his God was greater than the passion of his body. You see what I'm saying? Hmm. So forgiveness doesn't necessarily change a person's character or nature. So I believe I just answered a lot of questions. I don't know why they do that. Because they have to change their character and nature. That's what Martin Luther King was trying to tell people. But they expected him to be walking on the water like Jesus. Well, he couldn't. He's not a perfect man. And the guy that was trying to destroy him was J. Edgar Hoover. And yet J. Edgar Hoover had the biggest secret in the closet too. He was a homosexual. And he hated homosexuals. So he hated himself. Now that's confusion. Yes, right. In fact, I use that same statement. I went to the mall with Kathy and my granddaughter, Meredith Margot Walker. She came to spend the night. We were so glad. So she says, uh, I said, would y'all like to go to the mall? And you know, normally I go home. I went to the mall when I walked in because I carry the bags and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just standing there. And, and they were shocked that I just stood there and watch them spend my money. <laughs> I just stood there. In fact, I heard them calling me, grandfather, what are you doing? I said, thinking. Your grandfather's always thinking. And I just followed them. Let me have your bags. And man, we went to all the different places, shoe stores and, and the what? School shoes. And, and you ever heard of school shoes at Chanel? But anyway, I don't understand about that. You know? <laughs> but anyway, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but they had to have a little makeup and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And do you want the bag? Oh, yes, we want the bag. Why you want the bag? You got a big bag. You stick the little bit Chanel bag. Oh, no. Ain't nobody looking at the dealer's bag. I walk out dealers with that Chanel bag, you see people go. And you know what they're thinking? They've been, they've been, they, there's some money in that bag. Oh, that's why everybody wants the Louis Vuitton bags. I'm talking about the paper bag. I'm not talking about the purse. You ever notice they walk like, and it's so heavy. But oh, they're going to hold that bag. They want that bag, boy. That bag means a lot. <laughs> Why? It's telling something that this is not cheap. Hmm. And that's okay. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. I know, forget, I don't know if the, the Louis Vuitton store there at Canal Place, they, if they still only let so many people go in. I don't know if they've changed that or not. But I, I wasn't going to stand in that line. And Kathy and Jody and Mary are standing in that line. So uh, Kevin, I just walked over like they were in the line like where y'all are right there. I was about this far away and I just stood there. Right there by the entrance. And it took about, I guess, 40 minutes, 35, 40. Finally, they get to the front. The lady says, and I walked, she said, excuse me. I said, I'm the one with the money. They said, come on in. <laughs> I'm the one with the money. Just come on in. And I, I didn't do nothing but do what I'm doing now. I just walked around. And I noticed they were all looking at the bags and all the people were looking at me because I was the one with the money. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of that. Why should I be ashamed of that? Why should I act poor when I'm not poor? Isn't that living a lie? Huh? See, I'm not, I am not ashamed to give God honor even if the world's spitting on me and mad at me. Now, I don't throw it in their face, but I give him glory on everything I do. Amen. Now, what I'm about ready to read this point is probably the most important point in this message. Ready? Yes. Memory. Everybody say memory. memory. All right, listen to this. Memory too never forgives. Memory too never forgives. But what is impossible to us is possible to God. Memory never forgets. Now, oh, man, yeah, he's saved, but you know what he did before? 
Mm. Think about that for a minute. Memory, too, never forgives. But what is impossible to us is possible to God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he says, repent and believe the gospel. It's the good news. I don't forget one time a man was making a confession to me. I said, stop. You're going to put something in my memory that I need not know. I'm going to do like God. I'm going to throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. Never think of it again. So if your memory brings it up, shut it down. Amen. You haven't had it. It's not deep enough in the sea yet. Think about that. We had a wonderful time with Meredith. Never had this. She's 13, going on 27. You know how that is. And so she came over. And she likes to watch a movie. I said, you want, you want grandfather to put the theater on? She goes, no, let's talk. I said, talk. I said, yeah. She goes, has you ever had your heart broken, grandfather? Have you ever had a crush? I said, yeah. Who was your first girlfriend? You ready for this? Peggy Gidry. <laughs> she was 12 years old, living gold in metal. I like that. But I lived way past, and my dad had moved down to Venice because he had to go to work for Getty Oil Company down there. Peggy. And I'd get to see her once or twice. Oh, Lord. So we would write letters to each other. I said, that's called, what's that, babe? Did you tell her you loved her? No. <laughs> see, see, her memory never lets, see, she just proved my point. She just proved my point. Memory. She's still nailing me to the wall about that. Good God Almighty. Let me go pray for this woman. I need to lay hands on her. No, I didn't. And I said, puppy love, they call it, but it still hurts. It still hurts. And sometimes adults don't, don't understand that. Shut up, boy. You, you'll meet a girl next week. Oh, shut up, girl. Don't worry about it. No, no, they hurt. But they never let you forget. <laughs> never. <laughs> and she couldn't get over it. I said, yeah, oh, man, I liked her, but we broke up. You had any other one? I said, well, I was engaged one time to a, a, a lady. You were. I said, before I met you Mimi, and she cut me off. She said, didn't Mimi ever had a broken heart? I said, no, Mimi breaks hearts. <laughs> That's exactly what you said. Don't you lie in church, woman. That's exactly what you said. <laughs> I remember. Let me, oh, wait a minute, I got to put, put the Spock on her so she can remember. You know, Spock, you know how he does this? <laughs> remember. <laughs> she said, no, I just broke up with him. But when she fell in love with me, and I, I heard her heart. Yes, you heard it. <laughs> yeah, see, she won't let me forget that either. <laughs> but I never broke it. At least I don't think. Meredith wanted to know those things. They didn't want to know what's going on, see. <laughs> and then Kathy comes up with this last night. And then she says, you know, there's nothing like an old fool. <laughs> I knew she was talking about me because her memory is intact. <laughs> she forgives, but she don't forget. Mm -hmm. And she said, if something ever happened to me, and you, and he marries me, and you, how did she say, yeah, you hear him say, no, if I'm gone, and you marry a younger woman, <laughs> if I'm gone and you marry a younger woman, I want my friends to hurt you. I want my friends to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> now, buddy, that is not forgiveness, Kevin. <laughs> I want my friends to hurt you. Slowly. Well, I'm going to say it publicly. <laughs> Look at this here. What are you clapping for, Jonathan? You're supposed to be on my side. <laughs> I'm going to say it publicly. I ain't marrying a younger woman. I ain't marrying an older woman. I don't believe I am. 
And I don't think, I think we're going to heaven together as far as I'm concerned. Now you can applaud on that. So Kathy, this is the answer for you. It's my next point. Forgiveness is deliverance from sin. Forgiveness is deliverance from sin. I want her friends to hurt me. I mean, I got this word love just drives her nuts, you know, because I don't say that often. Have you ever told God you love him? I said, he knows. Oh, she just had a fit about that. Now, I want honesty here. How many of you may have had somebody break your heart and you wouldn't have mind if they'd have died? <laughs> Lift your hand up. Come on, don't lie. Come on, be honest. Lift your hand up, Kathy. <laughs> you want your friends to kill me? It's up to me. Sure. That's, see, memory never forgives. Now you understand my point. That's why God said, I'll put it behind my back because I'll never go backwards, I'll go forwards. I'll put it in the depths of the sea, never be remembered. I'll give, never be remembered against you. I will pardon all iniquities. I will delight in mercy. I'll give you an understanding on Pharaoh and his army when he went down. Mm. Forgiveness is deliverance from sin. Now, I want to deal with this little part and we'll close with this. Mercy. Write this down. Mercy is not a modern project. It's an ancient charter. God created mercy for us even before we were created. It's not, it's not a modern project. Mercy is not a modern project. It is an ancient charter. I told him, I, I said this, the other day. I had some people say, you know, you have a lot of black people work for you. I said, I don't have any black people work for me. Oh, yeah, you do. I said, no, I don't. Oh, I know you do. I said, I know you don't. No, I don't. See, I'm not going to fall in that trap. I said, I have people that work for me. I don't see no difference. Their check is the same color paper. <laughs> right? Hey, I'm for you. Uh -uh. I'm not going to have you separate. Uh -uh. I will not yield to that world system. I will not do it. Now, I mean, I get blasted for that. I believe in the human race. God created. I just love everybody. I just it. That's it. Did you know I'm a Jew? No. I'm not, I'm not going to let you separate. No. I'll, let me tell you something. Forget all the skin color junk. Don't forget your culture. That's who you are, your culture. We always have difficult. We have a Cajun culture, an Italian culture. You know, you got all kinds of different cultures. That's why it's called the neutral ground. That's why they had the French Quarter. You want to understand New Orleans? Let me help you here. New Orleans, French Quarter. They had the Italian Quarter. But see, but the Italians didn't go to the French, and the French didn't go to the to Italians. So they formed something called the neutral ground. So the French and the Italian could come on the neutral ground and do business and go back to their prospective neighborhoods. That's where the neutral ground is. Now, you think it's a place you can park your car when the flood comes. <laughs> no, no. Well, it's used for that sometimes, you know. But that's exactly what it is. You want to say something, Kathy? I don't know. That was on Canal Street before they Yeah, it. that was on Canal Street, yeah. See, she remembers greatly. They do. The neutral ground. Yeah. Sometimes me and Kathy have to come together on the neutral ground. Because I ain't going where she's going, and she ain't going where I'm going. So we both walk together to the neutral ground, and we do business. We agree to disagree. That way you ain't mad all day long. You know, it makes a good marriage to do that. It really does, you know. And then sometimes you just got to give up. Sometimes it's just, it ain't worth the fight. Okay. Mercy is not a modern project, but an ancient charter. Let me show you what it does and what forgiveness does. I'm going to go through this fast, then I'm going to come back so you can write it. When you have become estranged with God, 
Forgiveness brings reconciliation. Don't write it yet. I'm, I'm going to come back and say that again. When you become estranged with God, you know you did something, right, you, something wrong. You feel a distance. Forgiveness brings reconciliation. Maybe when you're indicted about something, forgiveness brings justification. you justify justified by faith. When you are polluted, you did something you shouldn't have done, and it just flat stunk. Forgiveness brings cleansing. I wrote this down this morning. Uh, when you are sick, forgiveness brings healing. When you're obstructed, trying to get where you, it, it, things are shutting you down. When you're obstructed, forgiveness brings clearing. Why? He delights in mercy. So you can write it down now. When you're estranged with God, you know, there's a, a little distance there, something, you feel it. Forgiveness brings reconciliation. If you and your wife have had a little argument and you repent and you ask her to forgive me or she forgive you, it brings reconciliation. So let me say it again. When you are estranged, forgiveness brings reconciliation. When you are indicted, if somebody says you did something, oh God, you, you don't think you have, but evidently they think you did. When you're indicted, forgiveness brings justification. God justifies you. Am I, am I talking too fast? You getting it? When you are indicted, forgiveness brings justification. Now, when you are polluted, let's say you blow it. Okay, you did something you shouldn't have done. When you are polluted, forgiveness brings cleansing. He'll make you as white as snow. That's a good thing. When you are sick in sickness, listen to me. A lot of time comes from sin. When you are sick, not all the time, but when you are sick, forgiveness brings healing. How did this virus got started? Why did it get started? What is the real reason for it? Money? Shut down a powerful nation? Let all your people go over to that nation, but don't let that nation come to you. See, when you are sick, forgiveness brings healing. And finally, when you are obstructed, just can't seem to get the job done. When you're obstructed, forgiveness brings clearing. This piece of property that the church is on had 600 trees on it. Did you know that? Right here. When we bought this, it, look, it looked woods, you know, small trees. Junk. We got in here, my staff, Ricky, uh, his son, then Jason, ma'am, we were cutting trees down like crazy. We saved one, two, we saved five of them. The real good ones. The rest of them were just, you know, just, I mean, we had to clean. Huh? Snakes had to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to get in. That's it, baby. A new order has come in. So when you obstruct it, forgiveness brings clearing. Then we cleared it. And it was going to cost us an arm and a leg to haul it all off. Trucks cost a lot of money. So I went get the, I found a man that has a chipper. And we ground all those trees. We looked like the three pyramids. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Remember that? How high them things were? But we got it cleaned out. Boy, I mean, we chipped it down the soda. Now, watch it. It was a blessing to the community. I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get all this. People were backing up with their pickup trucks, filling up their pickup trucks so they could use it for their flower beds and all the different things. They said, is, is it okay, Reverend? I said, take as much as you want. And slowly we begin to lose our pyramids. <laughs> you see, before technology came in, with people, uh, what's it called when you take a piece of paper and you run it through a machine? What's those machines called? Shredders. About right here. Under the slab of this edifice is about 1,500 boxes. 
of invoices. I dug holes and I buried it. Then we poured concrete on it. So let's say Jesus tired, and 2,000 years from now, they pull up and they'll put out an invoice that he bought from a camera in 1992 because no one could put it. What's the name of that? Uh, shred it. But then we found companies with major shredders. <laughs> we don't do that no more. You see, you had to do what you have to do because they didn't want to accept all the boxes in a dump. So I made my own dump. And I dumped on it. And I put dirt in it too, and around it, to make sure that when it rots, and it might never rot because it's pretty sealed in there, you won't have a cavern under the slab. Then I drove pilots, 1,796 pilots, through it. Hmm. See, I got rid of all the obstruction and I cleared this land so people could build on it. Now, let me go over there so you can get your, get your notes. Mercy is not a modern project, but an ancient charter. When you are estranged, forgiveness brings reconciliation. When you are indicted, forgiveness brings justification. When you are polluted, forgiveness brings cleansing. When you are sick, forgiveness brings healing. And when you are obstructed, forgiveness brings clearing. Why? Because he delights in mercy. This superstructure of salvation called the doctrine of forgiveness. So become what God made you to be, a forgiver and a forgetter, and go on about your business and do what God tells you to do. Now, can you understand how, why I can handle Persecution so easily. Some people say, boy, he just handles persecution like I never said. Why? I forgive and I forget. I'm going about my business. Now, there's a judgment side to God, but I'm not the judger. Amen. I might want to give him a few hints on how to work it, <laughs> but I got to watch myself on that because I don't want it to be said for my friends to hurt him. Just thought I'd throw that in there for some reason. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Today, Kathy says something freaked me out. I was laying in the bed about ready to clean up and go. She goes, I got to change these sheets. These things are dirty. I got out of that real fast. Not dirty, dirty, but she said, I don't know when. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm going to tell them everything, Kathy, since your friends want to hurt me. You understand? No, <laughs> no, no, that's payback. See, no, no. She figures all that stuff out. And she gets mad at me. She tries to help me pull this sheet under that mat. That thing is hard. Because she wants to be able to take a quarter. <clears throat> oh, so you've been in the Marines? So that the quarter can bounce on the sheet, you know. I don't know, but I've been told. Jesus Christ, bless you so. I said, this ain't the army here. I bought the sheets. Just get out my way. I just get out the way. And then when I get out the way, she's mad at me because I got out the way. You could have helped me, but you told me to get out the way. <laughs> Look at the men. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I understand. <laughs> it's kind of like, where you want to eat? I don't know. Where you want to eat? I don't know. You pick where you eat. Anything you want to go. So I pull up the place. I don't want to eat here. <laughs> Back up the car. Start over. What would you like to eat? How about not, let's not eat nothing. Just say what you want and pray to God that they listen. But you're going to get some food somewhere somehow. See, when you understand why, that's why God had to send himself to the persons of Christ. I'll say that because an angel could not do this. A cherubim, a seraphim, or archangel. Angel. No, no, they couldn't do it. They didn't have the power to do it. So God said, I will send myself in the personage of my son, Jesus. Think about that. It's, it's kind of hard to understand 
how he could take such pain, how he could do that because he delighted in the mercy so that you wouldn't have to do that. Did you enjoy it this morning? Did you learn something? Yeah. See. So when you understand those things, you'll be the person God wants you to be, not some of the time, but all the time in every facet. And since you're going to remember anything, remember the good stuff. If something blows up in your mind, it, it, that's true, but it makes you... Just say, no, since I'm going to think, I might as well think of something positive today. I'm just going to... Uh, you know, everybody has the little things that, that bothers them. And that's okay. You know, some women want their husbands to open up the car door. Some women are so fast, they, they don't wait for the car to open, they're already in the mall. They didn't pass the door of the mall. Uh, some people don't want you to snack when they're cooking. I want to taste something. Wait till it's on the table. When y'all were children and you had Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, did any of your family take pictures of the food? Anybody, hold your hand up if that happened. I want to ask a question. Have you ever taken out the pictures of the food? 20 years ago, you should have seen this turkey. <laughs> did, has anybody ever done that? No. What a waste. I used to sit there starving, man, salivating. I'd say, Mama, let's just eat the food instead of take a picture of it. Shut up, boy. We got tons of food pictures. But that's just what they did. How many of you made homemade ice cream? Your arm got sore. Well, wasn't that great? How many of you wanted the paddle inside the ice cream after they pulled it out? Hold your hand. Boy, and they would take it all, oh, no, no, leave some of it on there, boy. Just get it all over your face. Those were great times. And every Christmas then I ate as a child, I ate with a busted lip. <laughs> True. True story. Busted lip, swollen. Got pictures to prove it. Because right before the dinner, my uncles would come out. His sons, my dad. And they get the boxing gloves, and my boy going to whip your boy. <laughs> oh, yeah? And they bet on us. My dad said, I got 50 cents on you, boy. You better beat your cousin on Jerry. <laughs> and all of them will be sitting there eating like this. <laughs> and my uncle's counting the money and change. <laughs> they did it every year. But I got back at them. Because, see, the men always brag in front of other men about their wives. I'll tell you what, one of my uncle Ralph used to say, if I tell Esther to jump, she'd say, ha, ha. I heard that. And he bet against me. So I went up to my Aunt Esther, who we call Tatsy, because she's a little fat. I said, Aunt Tatsy, you know what Uncle Ralph said about you? What she said, Jess? He said, he said that every time he tell you to jump, you say, ha, ha. She said, Ralph, come here. <laughs> He lying. I said, no, I'm, I, I'm not lying. He said it. <laughs> and one day he had a busted lip. <laughs> Payback time. <laughs> I sure wish we could do that again. They're all in heaven. Probably with busted lips. <laughs> True story. Anybody ever did stuff like that? But all the people get together? My Lord. You ever have a bouchardie? You know what a bouchard is? You, know, you have that? Killing of a hog? Oh, Lord. Oh, man. And, and you have a, I mean, you don't lose anything on a hog but the squeal. That's it. You eat his lips. You eat his feet. You eat his skin. You wipe him out. He don't exist. It's like the seal of forgetfulness. And one of my best jobs was to kill that hog because I hated that hog because he'd bite me. I said, today is my day. <laughs> yeah, I'd ride him and twist his, he'd throw me and he'd try to bite me. I said, okay, baby, today is my day. I said, Grandpa, can I kill that sucker? Kill it. That hog go, boom. <laughs> I went, ha, 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 ha. But then he got up. 
I took off running and the hog bleeding like a stuck hog. Come after me. Thank God grandpa was there. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? I know y'all. Don't look at it. Every piece of chicken you eat today, somebody killed it. Every steak, somebody killed it. Even if you ate vegetables, somebody pulled a plant up and cooked it. So don't look at me weird. Why did you say that? I don't have the foggiest idea why I said that. <laughs> 